everyone in the room, although you already know this, but specifically for the benefit of our sister, Light68, whose husband is the JW. Okay, praise be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, bless this session. Fill me with the Spirit. Protect me from error. Anoint my mouth to glorify Christ and bless your people in Jesus' name. Thank our brother, Nehemiah, for recording this. Now, Nehemiah, did the, the recording yesterday, have you got it online yet or no? Java, do you have a question on the mic? Okay, let's see what the question is. I don't know. Your hand is raised. Java, quickly, brother. Do you need to ask me something on the mic? All right. We're going nowhere if no one's responding. One, mic test, mic test. Hello. Hello, darkness, my old friend. Rob, this is now five times, brother. You're blaming my mic on your computer, dude. All right, Java. Do you need to take the mic? Put a one, because I don't know. Okay. I was talking to some Muslims, so they told me they would like to debate you, but they want you to sort of maybe come over in my section where I'm at, and maybe we'll have it as a neutral room. I think they wanted to debate you and CP. Uh, but they said they wanted to, you know, to be fair without people dotting and balance, you know, and bouncing people out of the room. So I just wanted to talk to you about it to see if you would you would think about it or pray about it and let me get back with me and let me know. That's all. Why in the world would I want to go in your room and debate Muslims who can get away with murder and not answering directly? which is why they don't want to come in my room, because they know as the moment they go off topic, they're going to be dotted say, no, 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 sorry. You don't go anywhere to answer the question. So why in the world would I want to do that? Now, Java, why would I want to do that? Do me a favor next time. Please don't come to my mic and ask me about debating Muslims in your room. All right? Don't do that again, brother. Just, I appreciate it. And I like how you say Muslims. Muslims. Hopefully you don't end up calling them Moosehead. Right. So, Java, I don't know if you have your hand raised again. Put it down, friend, because we're not taking the mic again. <clears throat> I'm going to just begin the discussion. All right, because All right, it shows that you're in the queue. Anyway, I'm not interested, unless it's a formal public debate, I'm not interested in going to anyone's room where the Muslim's going to get away with three to five minutes uninterrupted of going on tangents and red herrings and answering nothing. If you have that kind of patience, God bless you. I'm still working on patience, trusting the Lord to make you more patient. I don't have that much time or patience, not yet anyway. You can handle that. More power to you, brother. God bless you. So, let's go to Colossians 1 and Revelation 3. Let's deal with that. Are we ready? Are we ready? By the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ? All right. I want to deal with these because either of the ones he brought up, this Hebrew roots Aryan, brought it up in Facebook, so I'm hoping he comes in, we can address those. Right? We can address those, because not only will it refute him, but Joe's witnesses and help our brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, like Light 68. Now, I don't know what that gentleman's name is. Hopefully, if he's here, maybe Towering Wings, he'll identify himself. I'm waiting for that Hebrew roots area. And by Aryan, I mean someone who holds to a similar teaching to Arius, because he kept mentioning Arianism, right? As if Arius had the correct view of the scriptures. We'll see. We'll see how far it gets. But are we ready? The deal with Colossians 1.15 and Hebrews, I'm sorry, Revelation 3.14, yeah. Not Arian, like A-R-Y-A-N, which is a neo-Nazi movement, but Arius and those who believe like him, that Jesus is the first creature of God, right? Okay, if you guys are ready, let me know. If we're all ready, by the grace of God. Now, I think I am his. We'll be able to post verses. If not, I'll have to do it. I'll just have to read them out loud. We ready? Patar, where are you at, brah? You've been awfully silent, sir. Now, you've already heard this. Some of you, I'm preaching to the choir. So, again, <clears throat> thank you for bearing with me. I was hoping Light would be here, but she's not. Christian Princess, you here? not getting much feedback. Only two people are responding. That's ironic. We got more than two people, only two are responding. Hmm, interesting. Just 
Christian princess here? She left? Where did she go? Wait, 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 wait. She's online, isn't she? Okay, hold on before I start. Is Christian princess around? Why is she idle? Come on. She left? All right, let's begin. Okay, Colossians 1.15. Colossians 1.15. Am I, are you still recording, brother? Are you still recording? We got now two Nehemiahs. So, you're on your phone. Okay, man, you got, you're, really, you're really confusing me that way. All right, Colossians 1.15. Let's start with that. As the Lord Jesus grants me clarity of thought and to focus by his grace and mercy. Colossians 1.15. Let's see what it says. He is the image of the invisible God and the firstborn of all creation. Firstborn of all creation. Let me repeat it again. Firstborn of all creation. So, now the King James says the firstborn of every creature. So please think, will you be able to post? If I can get one of you to do that, that's fine. Nobody can do that, then I'm going to do it. I Just let's get this settled now so that we can focus by the grace of God. Who's going to do it? Okay. Okay, please. Sir. Okay, guys, here's here's the objection. Yeah, as long as it's not too slow. Here's the objection, guys. Please follow with me. Focus by the grace of Jesus. You're going to learn this objection because this is their favorite text. There are three passages that Joe's Witnesses and others quote to try to prove that Christ is a creation. Proverbs 8.22, Colossians 1.15, Revelation 3.14. Proverbs 8.22, Colossians 1.15, Revelation 3.14. Those are the three. I've already addressed those in the past, and I'm sure that those sessions have been recorded, and they're somewhere on YouTube land. But let's deal with Colossians 1.15. It says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, the firstborn of all creation. There they take the phrase firstborn of every creature or of all creation to mean Christ is the first one from creation that was created. He's the firstborn. Meaning, when God created all things, the first creature, the firstborn, the one created first, made first, was Jesus Christ. That's how they interpret the word firstborn of all creation. It's like me saying, blind is the firstborn of his household. Firstborn of his household means he's the first son born to his parents. Obviously, if he's born, then he didn't exist always, and he's not as old as his parents, right? So if Jesus is the firstborn of all creation, obviously he cannot be eternal. He's part of creation, but he's the firstborn of it. When God created all things, he made Jesus first, and that's why he's the firstborn. You guys understand the objection? You understand what they're trying to prove? Yeah. Now, how to respond to that? Oops, time is up. I got to go, guys. God, God will see you tomorrow, right? So... Thank you. Take care. Enjoy Colossians 1.15. See you later. This guy, I am his. Hey, so, hey, I am his. What I want you to do is put down the pipe. You and Rob, whatever you guys are smoking, put it down. Put down the bong. Stop the alcohol. That's it. Okay, see you later, Sam. God bless you. That's it. You just you just want to shoo me away? No reaction like, hey, Sam, what do you mean? You just mentioned objection. You're not answering it. What are you doing, friend? Well, I can see how excited you are to find an answer. What? <laughs> see, that was a test. Some passed, but I am his. Definitely failed. I'm thinking he's going to say, wait, 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 Sam, what do you mean, bro? Why you leave us hanging, man? Here, let me sip on my bong a little more. All right, let's begin. By the grace of God. All right. There are three meanings to firstborn. Firstborn. Okay, you ready? Three meanings to firstborn. Right? You with me there? You guys got to get this, please. If you get this, then they can't use it against you. Okay? So three meanings of firstborn. One, the one born first. Two, 
the heir. Three, the one who is preeminent, has preeminence. Okay? Let me explain why. Okay. Having preeminence. These are the three meanings. The one born first, the one who is the heir, the one who is preeminent, having preeminence. Now, where do I get this from? I get it from the Bible. In the Bible, if you're born first, then you have preeminence. You are preeminent. You have supremacy over the rest of the family members. You're subject only to your parents, specifically your father. So to be born first is to have the status of preeminence. And if you're the one born first, you're automatically the heir. Are you with me there? So to be the firstborn, the one born first, makes you the heir of the estate, the heir of your father, right? And because you're the firstborn, you have supremacy, preeminence over the rest of the family members. All of them are subject to you because of your status as firstborn. Is, it, is that clear? Did you guys get the three definitions? The one born first, the one who's the heir, the one who's preeminent having preeminence. That's how it works in the Bible. So blind is the firstborn in his house. That means he is now supreme over his siblings. He has preeminence over them. He has authority over them. They're subject to him, and he's his father's heir. So whatever his father has belongs to him. This is in the Bible. Let me show you where the Bible says that the firstborn is the heir. Deuteronomy 21, Deuteronomy 21, 15 to 17. Deuteronomy 21, 15 to 17, as our brother please tries to post it, if you can't, that's okay, I'll then read it out loud. You just read the verses, okay? I'm sorry, you just write down the verses. If you can't post it on time, then I'm going to do it, okay? To be firstborn is to be the heir, okay? Now, it gets a little tricky here, but if you understand this, then this objection dissolves, right? It melts away. Deuteronomy 21, 15 to 17. Deuteronomy 21, 15 and 17, as the Lord Jesus grants me recall of passages, and not to forget. If a man have two wives, listen to this. If a man have two wives, one beloved and another hated. Here hated means loved less. You have two wives, you love one more than the other. Right? And they have borne him children, both the beloved and the hated, or the one loved less. Okay? And if the firstborn son be hers that was hated, if the one he loved less gave birth to the firstborn son, then it shall be, when he maketh his sons to inherit that which he hath, that he may not make the son of the beloved firstborn before the son of the hated, which is indeed the firstborn. Let me explain what it means. I got two wives. I love one. I don't love the other one as much. The one that I love less gives birth to my first child, my firstborn son. The one I love more also gives me birth, gives birth to a son, gives me a son. But her son is second. I am not to then give my inheritance to the second born, the one born to the woman I love more, just because the mother of my firstborn is the one I love less. You are not to do that. You with me there? But now notice verse 17. But he shall acknowledge the son of the hated for the firstborn by giving him a double portion of all that he hath, for he is, is the beginning, and you're missing a part. Please think you're missing a part of the verse. So go back and cut it into two sections. The beginning of his strength, the right of the firstborn is his. Did you catch it? He's the beginning of his strength. He's the first child he had, showing that he is virile and able to have children. Right? The start of his strength is virility. Right? For he is the beginning of his strength, the right of the firstborn is his. So notice if you're the firstborn, you get a double portion of the inheritance. So if there's a million dollars, then I got three sons. Right away, the firstborn gets half a million, and the other two share the other half. That's to acknowledge the status of the firstborn. So you see the firstborn is the heir, and the firstborn has supremacy over the rest of the siblings. Does everyone see that? Before I move on, i got to make sure you see it. Because I'm going to show you what definitions apply to Christ. If you're responding, that means... I can know whether you're understanding by the grace of God or not. If you're not responding, either because you've tuned me out, you're not interested. So i got to make sure you're understanding this. That's the whole point. I want you to understand it so then you can share it with others. If you've understood it correctly by the grace of God's Spirit. Okay. Now, with that said, with that said, 
Let me show you where firstborn is used in different senses. Firstborn is used with different senses. So let me repeat. The firstborn can refer to the one born first. And the one born first is the heir of the estate. And the one born first has preeminent supremacy over the rest of the members of the family. However, not every use of firstborn means the one born first. There are times in which the word is used to refer to a person's status as being supreme or to his role as the heir without this referring to him being born first. So there are times in which firstborn doesn't mean the one born first. You get it? There are times in which the word firstborn doesn't mean the one born first. Firstborn in those contexts mean the one who is supreme, has supremacy, he's preeminent, right? And or the heir. Not only in the Greek, no, no, no. We're here dealing with the Hebrew Old Testament. Don't just limit it to Greek. How's Greek going to help you when we're dealing with the Hebrew Old Testament? Put down the pipe, son. Put down the bong. We got three people talking too much hookah. Yeah. Are you with me here? Did everyone get it? Please think or not. Did I put you to sleep? No one's, you know, they're going to be here all day. Okay. I don't want to be here all day. I want to make my point. So please respond so I can make sure you're following along. Okay. Let me give you an example where the word firstborn is used in two different ways in the same context. Two different ways. Jacob had 12 sons. Jacob, who became Israel, had 12 sons. His firstborn was Reuben the one born first. His 11th son was Joseph. Joseph was son number 11. Reuben was the firstborn. Well, it depends on what you mean Isaac is firstborn. What sense is he firstborn, Rene? Now you explain it to me. What sense? Yeah, you got it. My second and third definition, Rene. He is the heir and he's preeminent. He holds the supremacy even over Ishmael, who's actually the one born first. You got it, sister. God bless you. Praise the Lord. She gave a good example. You got it. So Isaac becomes the firstborn in terms of status. He holds supremacy. He's preeminent even over the one born first. And he is the heir of the covenant. You got it, Renee. Lord bless you. Praise God. See, now that makes my day. Because the teacher wants the people to know and learn and understand the word applied for the glory of Christ. So God bless you, sister. So you got it, huh? Praise the Lord. Now I'm going to give you another example. Thank the Lord Jesus, not me. Everything good is from him. Let me give you another example, Renee and everyone else. Reuben was Jacob's firstborn son. The one born first. Okay? Joseph was Jacob's 11th son. 11th son. Right? The one who was born after the 10 other sons were born. You got it? Joseph is not firstborn, right? Joseph is the second to last son. The second to last of Jacob's 12 sons. He's son number 11. The first son born to Jacob is Reuben. Is everyone with me there? You get it? I gotta make sure you get this. Okay. If you got it, first chronicles chapter five, verses one of three. First Chronicles chapter five, verses one of three. If you get it, let's see. Reuben is the son born first, so he's first born in in order, in terms of chronology. But he's not first born in terms of status and and inheritance. Because notice what First Corinthians, First Chronicles 5, 1 and 3 is going to say. Now, you can write it down in case he's not able to post it. I'm going to read. Okay? First Chronicles chapter 5, verses 1 and 3. Now, the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel. Now, watch what it says. For he was the firstborn, because he's the one born first. But for as much as he defiled his father's bed. If you read the story of Genesis, you skip verse 1, brother. Verse 1 never showed up. And if you read Genesis, Reuben slept with Jacob's maidservant, actually the maidservant of his wife, 
So he dishonored his father by sleeping with his maidservant. And it says it. For he was born first, the firstborn. But for as much as he defiled his father's bed, his birthright, remember to be the firstborn, born first, your birthright is you're the heir. Your, first, your birthright is that you're the heir and you hold supremacy. You with me there? But his birthright, because Reuben's sinning against his father by sleeping with his father's maidservant, his birthright was taken away and given unto the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel. And the genealogy is not to be reckoned after the birthright. Did you catch it? You don't know. The genealogy is not reckoned after the birthright because Reuben is no longer, no longer has the status of being preeminent. He's no longer the one who holds supremacy, nor was he the heir. Joseph was given the status of firstborn in that Joseph became preeminent over all his brothers, and he was given the inheritance, which is why Jacob gave him a double portion. So let me read verse 3, 2 and 3. For Judah prevailed above his brethren, and of him came the chief ruler. But the birthright was Joseph's. The birthright was Joseph's. The sons, I say, of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, were Hanoch, Palu, Hazan, Karmi. Did you catch it? Reuben is born first. Reuben is born first. Hold on, let me break it down. This you got to see. But his birthright was taken away from him. Do you see that? I just posted it. Did it show up? Right? Okay. Read that, Rene, and everyone else. Okay? And here's the second part. Now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, were the firstborn, but for as much as he defiled his father's bed, his birthright were given unto the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel. Did you see that second quotation I posted? Rene, everyone else? And the genealogy is not to be reckoned after the birthright. You don't go by the order of birth anymore. That's not the order anymore. Now notice verse 2. Here's the key verse. Tell me if this shows up. Does this show up? For Judah prevailed above his brethren, and of him came the chief ruler, but the birthright was Joseph's. Okay, now, let me ask you a question. Who was the one born first? Who was first born in the sense of being born first? In Jacob's family. Okay, let's see how many of you got it. Okay, three of you, all right. Who was the one born first in Jacob's family so that he was first born in that sense? Come on, everyone else. Renee, everyone. Okay, you got it. Okay, now here. But who was given the birthright of firstborn? So who was firstborn in status in terms of preeminence and inheritance? Joseph. So notice, they're both firstborn. Reuben is firstborn in terms of chronology. He's the one born first. Joseph, son number 11, is firstborn in terms of status. He's now preeminent. He holds supremacy over all his brothers, and he was the heir. You catch it? So do you see how firstborn can mean different things depending on the context? Firstborn doesn't always mean the one born first. Firstborn doesn't always mean the one born first. Okay, let me give you another example where firstborn doesn't mean the one born first. Okay? Another example. Psalm 89, 19 to 20. Let's start with Psalm 89, 19 to 20. Okay? Psalm chapter 89, verses 19 to 20. Another example. See, once you know these things, then all these objections are easily refuted by the grace of God. Okay? Here you go. Psalm 89, 19 to 20. Did that show up? Then thou spakest in vision to thy Holy One, and saidst, I have laid upon one that is mighty. Pay attention to this. I have laid upon one that is mighty. I have exalted one chosen out of the people. I have found David my servant with my holy oil have I anointed him. Notice God is speaking of David. Psalm 89, 19-20. I have found David my servant with my holy oil I have anointed him. So this is about David. Now watch this. It's about David. In Psalm 89, chapter 89, verses 26 to 27. Psalm 89, verses 26 to 27. Watch here. What does God say about David? Pay attention. He shall cry unto me. Speaking of David. David will cry unto me. Thou art my father. Speaking to God, David will say, God is my father. 
my God and the rock of my salvation. Now notice what God is going to say about him in 27. Notice verse 27. Did I show up what I posted? Do you see it? You want to make sure you see it. Okay. Rene, read with me 27. Breathe everyone, read 27. Watch. Here it goes. Also, I will make David him my firstborn higher than the kings of the earth. Notice, God says, I'm going to make David my firstborn. But hold on. David wasn't the firstborn son. He was the youngest of eight sons born to Jesse. That's 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16 says, David was the youngest of eight sons. He was not the firstborn. Nor was he the first king of Israel, because Saul was king before him. So in what sense could David be the firstborn of anything when he's not the first son born in his family, and he's not the first king of the world, He's not even the first king of Israel. Saul was king before him. So what does it mean? What does it mean for him to be made God's firstborn? What does it mean? Can't mean chronology in terms of time. Can't mean that David was the first one born to his father's household. He was the youngest of eight sons. Can't mean the first king. Think about it. It's right in front of you. It's there. You don't need to guess. It's right there. You guys are guessing. God tells you in the second part of the verse. Higher than the kings of the earth. It's right there. He explained it to you in the verse, guys. Why are you guessing? So, uh, M.M., you got it? Michael, you got it? He is firstborn in terms of rank. He is preeminent, supreme. Over all the kings of the earth, he's higher than them in status and glory and honor because he's God's king. So he has supremacy over them. So notice firstborn here does not mean David is the first king or the first one born. So those definitions do not apply. What definition applies? Remember I gave three definitions. Firstborn can mean the one born first, the one who's the heir, and the one who's preeminent, holds preeminence, has supremacy. Which definitions apply to David as God's firstborn? He's not the one born first. He's the youngest of eight sons. And he's not the first king of the world. He's not even the first king of Israel. So which definition? You're guessing again, please think. Seriously. Can you read the verse and see? It's right there, please think. I'm not trying to put pressure on you, but it's right there. You were told. So you're guessing? I will make him my firstborn higher than the kings of the earth. So which definition applies? One, the one born first, two, the heir, or three, the one who has preeminence, who's preeminent, holding supremacy. What do you guys say? Renee, which definition applies? All of you, no, it's not. All of you said pre preeminence, you're right. But all of you said both two and three, the heir and the one who's preeminent, you're right as well. Because elsewhere we're told that the king of Israel is God's heir. God will give him the nations as his inheritance. So David is not the first one born. That definition doesn't apply. He's not the first king of Israel. That definition doesn't apply. But he is the one who is supreme, preeminent, and the one whom God will give the nations as an inheritance. And you're told what it means in the last part of verse 27. Also, I will make him my firstborn higher than the kings of the earth. Right there, you're told. Higher than the kings of the earth. No debate. Yep, he's a, he foreshadows Christ. And even in that same chapter, Psalm 89, we're told that God will make David's rule extend from sea to sea. That the entire earth will be subjected to David because he's God's man. So, did I give you enough proof to show that the word firstborn doesn't always refer to the one born first? Right? Did you get the proof? Yep, Renee, it does. Glory to Jesus, you saw it. So now when we come to Jesus Christ, though, Okay, now when we come to Colossians 1.15, when Jesus is said to be firstborn of all creation, 
Now we have to determine what does it mean. Does it mean the first one born, the first one created, the heir and the one who's preeminent? Or does it mean the one who is preeminent, the one who's the heir, or does it mean preeminent? What definition of firstborn would apply to Christ in the context? You don't need to guess. Paul goes on to tell you in the very next verse. But here, let me post it. Colossians 1, 15 and 17. Colossians 1, 15 and 17. I hope this is blessing you. I hope it's enter entertaining you, educating you, exciting you. You're getting excited, educated, and filled with joy to see who the Lord is. Okay, here you go. Did that show up? What I just posted? Did all of it show up? Oh, good. Okay, I, I figured how to post all of it. Okay, Renee and everyone else, here is the answer. What does Jesus mean? What does it mean for Jesus to be firstborn? Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Now, 16 says for. See that word for is telling you what Paul meant. Paul's not going to explain why Jesus is firstborn. That word for is explanatory. It's telling you here's the reason why Jesus is firstborn. Thank God, Light 68, you're here. Light, are you able to sit and listen? Because I'm explaining what Colossians 1.15 means, where Joe's witnesses use it to show Christ is the firstborn of all creation. We got the first 15 minutes recorded for you. So Lord willing, I'll probably go over it with you again, but I want you to keep up. So Light, you with me there? Okay. Here you go, Colossians 1.15 to 17. Okay. Follow with me, Renee, everyone else. Who is the image of the invisible God? Yeah, please. It's but you don't need to post right now. You can hold off. I'll tell you when to post. Guys, read with me. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? Verse 16 says, "For by him." See right there, that word "for" is Paul's way of explaining what it means for Christ to be firstborn. So he's going to explain now. He's basically saying, "Look, let me tell you what it means for Christ to be firstborn of every creature." Here's what it means: For by him were all things created. So. Every creature was created by Christ that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things, not some things, every creature, the entire creation, were created by him and for him. And he is, present tense, before all things. He exists before the entire creation. And by him all things consist. And he sustains the entire creation, all things. Okay, now, did you guys see that? When I posted it, did it show up? When I posted it, did it show up? Right there, did it show? I thought someone said, yeah, one, it showed up. Can you see it now? No. All right, hold on, hold on. A lot of people are coming in now. Hold on a second. I thought, but anyway, I read it out loud for you. I read it out loud. Okay, let's see. Let's try it again. Let's see if it'll work. Hopefully, yeah. Let's see. Let's see. Hopefully, it's working. Okay. How about now? Did it show up? No. No. Okay. Here you go. Let's do it line by line. No texting, guys. No texting. Even though I read it, still. Here you go. I hate when Call Talk does this. Please don't post anything yet, brother. I'll tell you when to post. Just hold on. Okay, the 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 passages I posted show up. Do you see it? Do you see it? Okay, go and read what I posted. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? Now, in 16. Verse 16 starts with the word for. The reason why it starts with the word for, here you go, is because that's explanatory. It's now explaining the reason why Jesus is firstborn. Paul is saying, Jesus is firstborn for this reason. So the for is telling you why he's firstborn. Now let's read why he's firstborn. For by him were all things created. Notice that it say most things, many things, 
or all things. Every creature, the entire creation. All things were created. Were all things created. That are in heaven and that are in earth. Visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. You guys see it? Let me post it again. Did that show up? See, blind can't be patient. He needs attention. You think he wants me to bounce him? Because he just can't sit down and not say anything. He's got to interject. My goodness. Okay. Do you see that, Renee, everyone else? Do you see it? Okay. The word for there, the word for, is explaining what it means that he's firstborn. See, this is why I'm taking time. I know I'm dragging. You're like, okay, come on, get, get to the point. No, I can't rush through this. If you don't get it, then you won't be able to prove your case. And glorify Christ, showing who, who truly is. For by him, for, here's the reason why he's firstborn. For by him were all things, not some things, the entire creation was created by Christ. That are in heaven, if you didn't get it. Everything in heaven he created. And that are on earth, he created everything in earth. Whether visible or invisible, things you see and cannot see. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things, not some things, were created by him and for him. And then verse 17, let me post it. Verse 17. Watch here. And he is, present tense, not was, he is before all things. He is before all creation. And by him, all things consist. He sustains the entire creation. All right. Notice what Paul went on to say by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He explains that Jesus is firstborn of every creature for the following reason. God the Father employed Jesus, his son, to create the entire creation, to create every creature, to create everything in creation, in heaven, on earth, visible and invisible, thrones, powers, dominions. In fact, God the Father used the Son to create all things for the Son, and the Son exists before the entire creation came into being, and it's the Son that sustains all creation. Did you get it? Did everyone get it? All right. Now, Renee and everyone else, if Christ exists before all things, all creation, and if Christ created all things, can he be part of the entire creation when he created the entire creation and is before it, both in terms of status and in time? If he exists before the entire creation, he exists before the entire creation, then that means he's not part of creation. He's eternal, right? Because what do you have before all creation came into being? You have eternity. Right? So then how can anyone use Colossians to show that Christ is the first creature when in the context Paul shows that Christ is the agent that God used to create all things that have come into existence? All things everywhere, in heaven, on earth, Visible, invisible, thrones, powers, dominions. He did it all. God the Father used him to create all things, which means he exists before all things necessarily. Well, if he exists before all things, then all things are all created things. That means he exists before the entire creation. And therefore, he's not part of creation, not initially, because later on he does become part of creation by becoming man. So that means he's eternal. Right? That means he's eternal, right? Is that clear? So now what does it mean for him to be firstborn? Here, let me show you what it means. Let me show you what it means. Here you go. Let me post Colossians 1.16. Supreme over <clears throat> everything or that particular thing that's being mentioned. Born first, heir, preeminence. Now let's see which definition applies to Christ, okay? Here again, let's see if you catch it. Here again. 
is verse 16. Let's see if you catch it. Watch here. Okay. Let's see if you catch it. For by him, did that show up, by the way? For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. The entire creation was made for Jesus, the Father's beloved Son. So the, the word firstborn can mean one born first, the heir, and the one who's preeminent. Which definition applies in the context? Can't mean the one born first because he existed before all creation. Right? But then at the last part of 16 it says, everything was created for him. So who owns all creation? Creation exists for whose glory? Right. It was made for who? So what definition applies? What definition applies? You said two and three. Okay, why three? Preeminent. Why would he be preeminent? So obviously if everything's created for him, then he's the heir. So definition two, he's the heir. Creation belongs to him. Not the one born first, because he existed before all creation, therefore he's eternal. But why did you say preeminent? You said two and three, meaning that he's the heir and he's preeminent. You guys are right. But why? Yes, he is preeminent. Now, but what's the reason, though? Explain. How do we know that the word preeminent, supremacy, is part of Jesus' status as firstborn of all, over all creation? Does anyone know? The second part, Chris, because he is before the entire creation and he is its creator. If anyone is supreme over creation, is preeminent over creation, has supremacy over creation, it would be the creator. Exactly. It's because he created and sustains all things. Exactly. But in case it's not clear, notice Colossians 1.18. Did that show up? Colossians 1.18. Did that show up? Okay, good. Now let's see. You want proof that it means supremacy, preeminence? Notice, Colossians 1.18, read it with me. And he, Christ, is the head of the body. He, Christ, is the head of the body. Right? The church, who is the beginning. He's the one who started all. He caused it all. Right? Beginning in the sense of causing it all to come into being. The firstborn from the dead. The one who conquered and has preeminence over death. That in all things he might have the preeminence. Bam, right there. There's your definition. In everything, Christ is preeminent, holds supremacy. He is supreme because he's the creator of all creation, the sustainer of all creation, the one who conquered death, the head of the church, and the savior of creation. You don't get more preeminent than that. Right? You do not get more preeminent than that. Is everyone with me? Is it making sense? So here's how you refute the Jehovah's Witness perversion of Colossians 1.15. But i got to add more points, if you don't mind. i got to add more points, if you don't mind. Yeah, everyone get it, though? If, if someone's confused, put it too. Because I don't want to move on if, if you guys are confused. Okay, no twos? All right. Notice it said... All things were created for him in Colossians 1.16. Let's let me show it to you again. All things were created for him. Okay, now this is really going to be perplexing. Because unless you believe Paul is contradicting the Old Testament, this clearly proves Jesus must be Jehovah God Almighty, even though he's not the Father. He's just as old as the Father. Okay? Here. Let me post 16 again. Okay, watch here. And for him, and for him, 
So all creation was made by the Father and Son and Spirit for the Son. It's for Him. It's His possession. All right. Now we got a problem, guys. Let me show you what the problem is. Isaiah 43, 6 and 7. Isaiah 43, 6 and 7. Let me post it one at a time. So bear with me as I post by the grace of Jesus, our Lord. So you can see it with your own eyes. Okay? Hold on. Isaiah 43, but you guys can write down the verses or wait for the recording. Isaiah 43, 6 to 7. Watch what it says here. Watch here. Isaiah 43, 6 to 7. Guys, you guys keep coming out. You're killing me. Right? Get on a PC if the phones ain't working. Okay, Isaiah 43, 6 to 7. Let me post it again. You see it? Did it show up? Did that verse show up? Okay, let me see here now. Here. Let's read it. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from far and my daughters from the ends of the earth. That's Isaiah 43, 6. Here's 7. Tell me if 7 shows up. Did 7 show up? Renee, everyone else? Who's paying attention by the grace of God? Rob, hope you're not asleep. Patar, I don't know what happened to you. You seen it? All right, let's 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 read it then. Isaiah 43, 6 to 7. Every, even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. Okay, now I'm confused. God says that he created these people for his glory, not for someone else's glory. But Paul says all creation, every part of creation, was made for Christ. But here Jehovah Yahweh says, no, I made these people for my glory, not for someone else. Okay, I'm confused now. Is all creation created for Christ? Or is creation made for the glory of Yahweh? What is it? Now, Isaiah 43, 20 and 21. Isaiah 43, 20 to 21. Same chapter. You got it, Renee. He is? Okay, Patar, hold on. Okay, Patar, put a one if the restrictions move. Okay? Okay, good. Praise the Lord. So you were listening at least, right, Patar? Throughout this all? Okay. Isaiah 43, 20. Here goes. Read, Patar. Isaiah 43, 20. And now I'm going to post 21. Here's 21. Colossians 1, 16 says, Everything was created for Christ. Isaiah 43, 6 and 7 and 20, 21 says, Everything was created for Yahweh, Jehovah, for His glory. Notice Isaiah 43, 20, 21. The beast of the field shall honor me, the dragons and the owls, because I give waters in the wilderness, because I provide for them. I'm their sustainer. But wait, Paul said in Colossians 1.17, Christ sustains everything. Here Yahweh, Jehovah says, I'm the one who gives sustenance to my animals, to my creatures. That's why they'll glorify me, because they know I'm their sustainer. Paul says, in Christ, in him all things consist. And rivers in the desert. This people have I formed for myself. They shall show forth my praise. Wait, wait, wait. Jehovah says, this people I have formed for myself, for me. I have made them for my glory. Even the animals will praise me because they know I sustain them. Colossians 1.16 says, all things were made by Christ, for Christ, and in Christ everything is kept, preserved, and sustained. What's going on here? Of course, Jesus is truly God in the flesh, even though he's not the Father, he's not the Spirit. All three are one God. Okay, but what's going on here? How can Jesus be the first creature when he created the entire creation, he exists before the entire creation, and the entire creation was made for him, and he sustains the entire creation? How in the world can you use that passage to pervert it to teach that Christ is a creature? How do, how's that, how do you do that and get away with it? How do you pervert it to teach something contrary to what Paul was teaching? So notice contextually, firstborn does not mean the one born first. It means the one who is supreme, preeminent, superior to all creation, because he created everything for himself. So it means he's the heir and the one who's preeminent. That's all it means. Only two of the three definitions apply to him in the context. But it gets a little worse for our anti-Trinitarian friends. According to the Bible, 
in two places. It says Jehovah God created the heavens and the earth by himself. He didn't have anyone helping him. Write down Isaiah 44, verse 24. Isaiah 44, verse 24. And Job chapter 9, verse 8. Isaiah 44, verse 24. And Job chapter 9, verse 8. Here's Job. Here's Job. Let's see what Job says. Okay. Watch here. Read this with me, guys. Who helped Jehovah? Who assisted Jehovah in spreading out the heavens and making the heavens? Here, Job 9. We start with Job 9, right here. Job 9, verse 8. Job 9, verse 8. Which alone, God alone, spreadeth out the heavens and treadeth upon the ways of the sea. Did Jehovah have anyone helping him in spreading out the heavens? Did he have anyone assisting him? Helping him create? Now please think, post it, Isaiah 44, 24, but I'm going to post it as well. Here's Isaiah 44, 24. Here's Isaiah 44, 24. Watch here. Read with me, guys. Thus saith the Lord, in Hebrew, Jehovah. Read with me. And he that formed thee from the womb, he's the one who formed all of us in the womb. I am Jehovah the Lord that maketh all things. But wait, Paul said in Colossians 1, 16, the Son of God, the firstborn, the image of the invisible of God, he made all things. He created all things. That stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. By myself. Two passages in two different contexts, both of which affirm God did it all alone. He didn't have any helpers and no creature helping him. So, if Jesus was used by the Father to create everything in existence, to create all that exists everywhere, the entire creation. And the Father used Jesus to sustain the entire creation. And the Father had Jesus create the entire creation for Jesus. But the Hebrew Bible tells us Jehovah alone by himself created the entire creation, the cosmos. And Jehovah created it for his glory, for himself. Either we have a contradiction, Paul is saying God used a creature to do it, or Paul is revealing to us that the identity of Jehovah is not limited to the Father. That both Father and Son are the one God, Jehovah, the creator and sustainer of all things, along with their Holy Spirit. How many options do you have? How many choices do you have if you believe the New Testament is consistent with the Hebrew Bible? Do you have the option of saying, yeah, Jehovah used the creature to create all things, according to Paul. No, because that's a blatant contradiction. So the only option you're left with is that Father and Son together make up the identity of Jehovah along with the Holy Spirit. Yep, beautiful. You catch it there? Now let me show you how powerful this passage is. Colossians 1 is so powerful that even the Jehovah's Witnesses saw, meaning the society who produced their Bible, saw how devastating this passage is. So guess what they did? Here's what I want to show you. Now I need all of you to click on it. Guess what they did? They saw that this is so powerful, such a powerful refutation, that they could not leave the text as it is. So here's what I want you to do. Here's the link to Colossians 1.16. I'm going to post it here. Watch here. Then I'm going to show you what their own Greek interlinear says, the one they use. Click on it, guys. I'm going to try to post it see if it shows up. Okay? It is so powerful, and the society saw how powerful it is in proving that Christ is uncreated by nature. They had to tamper with it. Now tell me if this shows up. Did that show up? Do you see it? Oh, oh okay then. There's an icon. All right, let me just then break it down. Let me break it down. Hold on. Let me break it down. Okay. Here, I'm going to break it down in two segments. But you guys click on it as well. All right. Did this show up? Do you see this? Did that appear? Good. Okay. Here's that first part. Let me quote the second part. Okay, here's the second part. Catch it, guys. Look at how dishonest they are. Watch here. Read. Did the second part show up? All right, now read. Renee, light, everyone read the New World Perversion. 
because by means of him all other things were created. You see, they inserted the word other in the heavens and the earth, the things visible and things invisible. Whether they are thrones or lordships or governments or authorities, all other things have been created through him and for him. Did you see? They inserted the word other. He didn't create all things. He created all other things. Now, well, wait. Let's see verse 17. Now, tell me if this all appears. I'm going to post it all. If not, I'll break it down into two sections. Okay, watch here. Nope, I'm going to show you from their own Greek into linear, the word other is not there, from their own Greek. Did that show up, that verse? Verse 17, I posted it. Okay, now guys, read. Again, here, read. And also, he is before all other things. And by means of him, all other things were made to exist. He is not before all things. He's before all other things. And by means of him, all other things were made to exist. They inserted the word other four times in order to keep their members from seeing the clear teaching of Paul that Christ made everything that has been created. Christ created every created thing. And therefore, he's eternal, not part of creation. He later then becomes part of creation by choosing to become human from his blessed mother. That's when he entered creation became part of it. But by nature, he's not part of it. He's eternal. All other things, please think, means that he himself was created and everything after him he made. All other things means that he didn't create everything because he himself was created first. And then after he was created, then he made everything else. You get it? You see what they did? You see? Now you tell me this is not of Satan. By the way, Light, I know you've been listening, but... Did you see how to respond to firstborn of all creation? Now, we recorded this from the beginning for the benefit of people like you who are not here. I'll give you the link. I'm showing how you can refute their misuse of Colossians 1.15. But did you get the point that firstborn doesn't always mean the one born first light? Did you get that? And you saw that in the context, clearly firstborn doesn't mean Jesus is the first one born when he created everything in existence and therefore is eternal. Right? So he can't be the first one born. So firstborn in reference to him means he's the heir because everything was made for him. And he's supreme over all creation by virtue of being its creator, sustainer, and savior. Praise his holy name. Our Lord is beautiful. The Trinity is beautiful. The Trinity is real. But wait, I'm not done yet. Not done yet. Let me now show you their New World Translation Greek interlinear. You can go to their own interlinear and say, hey guys, here's your interlinear, your own Greek that you use to translate in your Greek there is no there is no word other so why in the world would you dare dare mistranslate let me get it for you the online library here you go here's the link thank the Lord for modern technology this is all free online here you go is Alana kosher I don't remember can someone vouch for him or is that that Muslim that comes in and attacks there's the link to their Bible versions you're going to see it says kingdom interlinear. Kingdom interlinear. Okay, here you go. This is the link to their interlinear, their Greek text. Guys, click on it. Go with me to Colossians 1. Colossians 1, here you go. This is their own Greek, guys. Okay, here's the link. I posted it twice, each link twice. Please click on it. Do me a favor, please click on it. When you click on it, you're going to go to Colossians 1.16, and I'll give you even the precise link for that. Colossians 1.16, here you go, and I'm going to read it for you, all right? Look at the Greek. Just look at the English words, if you can't read Greek. Notice in the top, because in him, Hati and Auto, it was created the all things. Did you see it? Even in their Greek, it's all things, not all other. Panta. There is no other in the Greek. In the heavens and upon the earth, the things visible and the things invisible, whether thrones or lordships or governments or authorities, the all things, panton, right? Panta, I'm sorry, I skipped the line. The all things, ta panta, all, doesn't say other. There's no other in the Greek. Through him, di autu, and into him, kai ice auton, 
that has been created. Ekhtistai. All right, now, notice 17. And he is, Estin, before all things, Panton, not all other things, and the all things, Tapanta, in him it has stood together. Sunestikin, Sunestikin. Did you see that from their own Greek? Their own Greek shows that the word is all, not all other. The word other is not there, and this is their own Greek that they translate from. Right? Do you see it or no? Isn't it clear? Now let me ask every one of you a question. Why do you think the society would insert the word other four times in Colossians 1, 16 and 17? Why do you think they didn't leave the translation as is? That Christ was used by the Father to create all things in heaven and on earth, whether visible, invisible, whether thrones, dominions, powers, or principalities. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things consist. Why do you think they inserted the word other? And you're telling me this is not a malicious, pernicious, satanic translation done under the influence of Satan, whether they realize it or not? Really? Is that what you want to convince me? Now, you see why your heart should break for Joe's witnesses? I'm not talking about the society, the people who produce this, this evil to assault the dignity and majesty of the Trinity. I'm talking about the members who've been deceived and duped into thinking this is a society from God, like Light's husband. Your heart should break for them as it should break for Muslims, as it should, it should break for these people who need us to pray for them and be used of God to teach them if they're going to be teachable. But if you see that they persist in their unbelief, then you need to expose them, shame them, put them in their place, lest they prey on innocent victims. Right? Exactly, Renee. So you see how you decimate their argument from Colossians 1.15? You see how easy it is? If you know context, you know how the words in the Bible are used, there is no way you're going to walk away assuming that firstborn of all creation means Christ is the first creature. When the verses that come right after show that our Lord Jesus is the one whom the Father was pleased to have create the entire creation, sustain the entire creation, exist before the entire creation, and the Father wanted to make all creation for the Son as an expression of his love for the Son, along with the Holy Spirit. He tries to explain that it's a part of the genitive, that He's only being excluded from all creation, even though he's a part of it, in order to establish his exalted status over the creation that he's a part of. It's called a part of the genitive, which begs the question, right? I don't, I don't want to confuse you with technical jargon. No, there's nothing in the word firstborn of all creation that makes it a part of the genitive. Part of the genitive means that you're part of a group, but you're being distinguished from that group in order to make a point about you in relationship to the group. For example, right, a tenth of the crop. Notice, a tenth of the crop. That tenth is part of the crop, but I'm now distinguished from the crop that it belongs to, right? So take a tenth of the crop. See, notice, tenth of the crop, that's a part of the genitive. It's part of the crop, but you're now distinguishing it from the crop. In point of fact, Colossians 1.15, firstborn of all creation, is what Daniel Wallace says is a genitive of subornation. Genitive subornation means that here he's firstborn of all creation, not in the sense that he's part of creation, but that all creation is subject subordinate to him by virtue of him being its creator, sustainer. That's why the NIV translates it as firstborn over all creation. See, that's the genitive of subordination. Well, Rob, can you vouch for Allah? Is, is he a Christian or a Muslim? Right. Now, you don't need to know all these finer points of grammar. You don't need to know partitive, genitive, or genitive of subordination. What I told you in simple English by the grace of God's Spirit, oh, so it is? Okay, I'm sorry, Alana. I, I get there's people that have similar names, so I don't know if they're Muslim or Christian. Welcome, sister. Lord bless you. Right? You don't need to know these finer points of Greek. You don't need to know... Part of the genitive or genitive of subordination. 
What I explained to you in plain English is sufficient to prove your case that Christ is no creature, right? So, I hope that was clear. It is a genitive of subornation, not a partitive genitive, right? That's why NIV renders it as firstborn over all creation. See, now it's showing you that he is over creation because creation is subordinate to him, subject to him, right? So hope that's clear. Was that clear thus far? How Colossians 1.15 to 18 in context proves that Christ is the eternal creator, the sovereign creator, Lord, who is supreme over the creation he made for his glory, in union with the Father and the Holy Spirit. God bless you, please, thank you. Right? Is that clear for everyone? Everyone get it? If anyone's confused, put a two. If there's still some of you not getting it, put a two. And thank our brother Nehemiah. This two is being recorded so you can hear it in full and go back and take notes and memorize it and use it for the glory of Jesus. Let's take a short five-minute break. I have some more to say about Colossians. And Lord willing, I may have time to address Revelation 3. Let's see. But let's take a short five-minute break. Okay? Yeah, uh, they came to my house outside the door, and it was about, it was two guys. Uh, it was lasted over probably an hour. Uh, they tried really hard. Um, I had learned the teaching from Sam about the angel of the Lord, so that helped me. Uh, I did use Isaiah 9, 6, and Micah 5, 2, which I love those two verses, um, which I can use them with Muslims as well because you can use them with Jews, because it's clear evidence. And you need, as Sam mentioned earlier, you need to know how to use them. And when these two Yehovah Witness guys came, um, they probably thought they were going to play around with me. Um, they ended up, they were, when I, when I said they were fighting with each other, they, they kept telling to each other, no, 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 let, let me, let me, let me, let, let me sort of explain to him. You know, they, they were, honestly, they were arguing with each other. You know, I was just watching. I was in shock. And one of the things, guys, is you may make an assumption that those people that come to the door, they know the Bible, don't think they know the Bible. They don't. When I was showing them, like, for example, Mecca 5.2, they were shocked to see that. They didn't know about it. I'm, I'm being serious. They didn't know about it. I went I went on the on the mosque once and it was the first time I had been and I showed I showed Micah five two to a Muslim and honestly he grabbed my he grabbed my phone and he wanted to see it. He was like, Let me see that again. And this was like a like an Imam or something. So what I wanna say is um don't assume that they know. There are loads of things they don't know. They've been taught a certain way, so you have to show them. Don't think that they know what you're saying. So you have to show even the simple verses that you may expect them to know. And when I was showing them these verses, I was even showing this, this one, the visible or invisible God. Um, even that, you know, they were shocked. Um, the, you know, they, they just didn't know how to respond. Um, they, they couldn't respond. And they never came back. Usually, if they knew they had a case, they usually come back. They never came back. Uh, but you could tell that these guys were really struggling, they were arguing with each other. Um, I don't think they expected me, because I don't look the type that I know. I don't look like the type that knows how to answer. You know, I don't have the knowledge of some, but I'm able also to, when it comes to arguments, I'm, able, I'm good at debating, in a sense. I don't have the knowledge of the some, of course, but I'm decent when it comes to debating, so I know how to make an argument. All right, Sam is here. Mark three. Thank you, Sam. God bless. Yeah, you didn't need to come up, really. You could have finished your point. Did you finish your point? Or do you want more time? Did you finish your point or no? Can you hear me, guys? Rob, didn't I say don't make your mic problem my problem? Anyway, just kidding. Coming back. I just posted the link to my article three times. You know, I love you, Rob, but not too much, right? I hope I don't offend you too much. I want you to keep coming to grow. Number one, it's not about you 
having my knowledge. It's about you being used of the Holy Spirit to glorify Jesus because it's the Holy Spirit who gives you knowledge. So praise Jesus for your faithfulness. Remain faithful to the Lord. Love the Lord. Serve the Lord. Obey Him and share the good news. And God, strengthen you because we need more people like you, not less. So it's not about you comparing yourself to me. Don't ever compare yourself to any other man or woman of God. The standard is Jesus Christ, our Lord. He's the standard. And we're never going to live up to him or match him, which is why we never stop trying to do more for his glory and love him, because we can't love him enough. Thank God for you that you are doing something, right? With the no, little knowledge or the ton of knowledge, you're using it. it. It is of no use to have lots of knowledge and store it to yourself that doesn't glorify God, that actually grieves the spirit that given you such wisdom and you're not using it. So thank the Lord Jesus for you and everyone in the room. You're here because you want to know God, love God, know what His Word demands of you so you can live for His glory and the power of the Holy Spirit and then share that. That's why I want you guys to know this stuff. That's why I got on Rob's case, not because I want to belittle him. You must make sure that you understand what you're hearing. And if you don't, just ask. It's okay. Once you do, share it and live it for the glory of Jesus. Batman, let's just focus on on the topic here before you and Superman take a flight to Krypton. So let's just focus here. Let's not talk about me because I want to talk about this. All right. Praise the Lord for you, Alana. A great website is uh, mrm.org. mrm.org. One of the best websites using Mormon literature to refute them and show them the truth of the gospel. mrm.org. So remember that. God use you mightily. Now, I just posted the link. This is now the fifth time I did. I wrote an article on Arianism and why it's irrational. Let me now help you understand the article. Save it, study it, use it, pass it on for the glory of Jesus. Here's another nightmare for the Jehovah Witness Arian position that they do not have an answer for. So what do I mean? Follow with me. This is going to be the final point I'm going to make about Colossians 1. Typically, these anti-Trinitarians, whether Joe's witnesses or these Hebrew roots heretics who believe that Christ is the first creation, will tell you that Jesus is a spirit creature. And in the case of Joe's witnesses, he's the Archangel Michael. Now, remember this argument. If you get this argument, light and everyone else, it's going to be a nightmare for them. They don't know how to answer this one. Now, follow with me. You ask them, angels are created to dwell somewhere. Angels... Yeah, they're actually Hebrew roots that believe Jesus either is the first creature or just a man. Much like in quote-unquote Christianity, you have various expressions of the Hebrew roots heresy. Some of them are not heretics. Some of them are actually diehard Trinitarians, and they don't make it an issue of you keeping the law to be saved. So those so-called Hebrew roots followers, I consider them true brothers and sisters in Christ. So they're not heretics. I wouldn't classify them as such. There are others who say Jesus just the man, no more, no less, or the first creation of Jehovah. Those are heretics. And those who insist you ought to keep the law, that's heresy. So not all Hebrew roots advocates, devotees, believe the same thing. So you got to ask questions. So, Doc, make sure you ask questions. Say, hey, you're Hebrew roots. Do you believe in the Trinity? He'll probably say, I don't like Trinity. I like, you know, uh, uh, you know, I like, uh, 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 yeah, all right. Then you know something's wrong with this guy. Okay. Must I keep the law to be saved? Yeah. Now, here's the link. Follow with this argument. Doc, everyone, you get this argument? It's a nightmare. I, I promise you. I've used this. I'm giving you arguments that I've used in combat, meaning spiritual combat, because that's what we're called to do. Spiritual, not physical combat, in the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Christ. Okay. You ask the Jehovah's Witness or this the, the Arian, say, angels need a dwelling place, right? Like human beings, their dwelling place is the earth. Yeah. Could you have angels existing before their dwelling place? No. Where do angels dwell? What is the dwelling place of angels? What is the dwelling place of spirit creatures, like the four living creatures, 24 elders? Where do they dwell? Tell me, guys, where do they dwell? You got it. Heaven. All right. Now follow me. Just like God had to create the earth before man could exist, because man is created to exist on the earth. 
Likewise, heaven had to be created before these spirit creatures could exist because if heaven wasn't created first, where would they be dwelling? Because remember, before the creation of heaven and earth, there is no place, space, or time. The only being that exists is God. This is why God, by nature, is spaceless, placeless. He's a unique being whose existence is beyond our ability to comprehend because he's the only being that doesn't need space or place to dwell. You with me there? You with me there? Now, Maya, you're still recording, right, brother? Okay. Now, let me show you the other argument. All right. If Jesus is not God, then he's a creature, and as a creature, he's bound to time, space, and place. Since they're telling you he's a spirit creature, that means Jesus needed heaven to exist in. But here's the problem. They'll tell you Jesus created heaven and everything in it. Yet Jesus is a spirit creature who existed before heaven was made. So where was Jesus dwelling? Where was Jesus living in? Because as a creature, he's not spaceless, he's not placeless, he's not timeless. As a creature, he needs a place to live in. Only God is spaceless, placeless. So where was Jesus living? Where was he dwelling before heaven was created? This is all in my article, by the way. I even quote the society admitting Jesus created heaven and everything in it. Well, hold on. Where was he dwelling? If he's a spirit creature, an angel, he has to have a dwelling place, like all angels do. And like men need a dwelling place, so we can dwell on earth, but we can also dwell in heaven when we die and our spirits leave our bodies. But God alone doesn't need a place, doesn't need to dwell anywhere. God alone. But you're telling me Jesus isn't God. So he's a creature bound to time, space, and place. So where did this creature dwell? Where was he living in before he created heaven? With the Father where? There is no place with the Father. So, Doc, that makes no sense. With the Father? Where? The Father doesn't exist in place or time and space. So what do you mean with the Father? According to them, he's not God. The Jehovah Witness elder and his wife told me, you know what they told me? That's a mystery that Jehovah hasn't revealed. We'll probably never know. That's a mystery. Now, I guess please think doesn't understand. Please, which part of the argument you don't understand? This is not an argument for you to answer. Why are you answering it? It's for Jehovah's Witnesses. Do you believe Jesus is a creature? You don't, please think. So then why are you quoting John 17, 5? Why are you trying to answer for them? Do you even understand the objection, brother? Let me repeat it again. Jehovah's Witnesses believe Jesus is a spirit creature. Spirit creatures, by necessity, are bound to time, space, and place. That's why heaven is created, and then the angels were created to live in heaven. If Jesus is a spirit creature, he needs a dwelling place. But Jehovah's Witnesses will tell you, on the basis of the Bible, Jehovah used Jesus to create heaven and everything in it. That means Jesus existed before heaven and earth. Where did he exist in? Because he's not God to them, and because he's not God, he can't be timeless or placeless. Where did he exist? Where did he exist? Now you try to answer for the Jehovah's Witness. There's the link to my article. They don't believe he's the creator, M.M. So don't, don't assume they believe like you. That's the point. Try to now put yourself in their shoes and come up with an answer. Jesus is a creature. As a creature, he's bound to time, space, and place like all creatures. And as a spirit creature, his dwelling place would be heaven, which means heaven had to exist before him. But the Jehovah's Witnesses agree. Jesus created heaven and everything in it. That means he's older than heaven, but he's still a creature. When, Where did Jesus exist before heaven and earth, before there was time, space, and place? Because he can't be timeless and spaceless and placeless, because that means he's God. Only God is timeless, spaceless, and placeless. So where was he living? 
Now, if they tell you, well, he's living in God, well, God is not a place. He's not a location. God is a state of existence, a state of being. For him to be in God, that means he's part of God's existence, his being. Therefore, he's not part of creation. He's eternal. I've never used that against Stafford, so I don't know. You really like Stafford, bro. You want me to send you a poster of Stafford? Maybe autographed photo? Find you a signed copy of Stafford's book? I mean, here's a... You ready to burn incense to this picture, bro? Because it's Stafford, Stafford. Ooh, I dream of Stafford. Oh, oh, what's wrong with you, man? Come on, bro. Come on, put down the pipe, son. A lot of people today have been on that bong, you know? Hookah. Put it down. Okay, you with me there? Now, light and everyone else, if you're a Joe Witness, what would you say? What would you say? You have nothing to say because your position is irrational. Why do you think, here, I'm going to post the article again. Please use it, save it, study it. Okay. Why do you think the title of my article is Jesus as the First Creature, The Impossibility and Irrationality of the Aryan Position? Did you catch it? The Impossibility and Irrationality of the Aryan Position. It is impossible for Arianism to be true if Jesus created heaven and all that's in it. Because obviously the heavens were formed before the earth, right? Because that means Jesus existed without place or space. How? How could he exist without space or place when that would make him spaceless and placeless and only God by definition is spaceless and placeless, a reality that we can't fully comprehend. That's why he's God and we're not. Is it making sense? Okay, so Renee, let me know when you're back. Is that making sense? You see how irrefutable the truth of the Trinity is, how irrefutable the biblical data concerning the Trinity and the deity of Christ truly happens to be, right? Data is plural, data is singular, right? You get it? You see it? I mean, there's. I'm telling you, don't believe me? Use this argument. Take my article, take down the quotations from the society literature that I provided, Take the verses down and say, okay, so Jesus created heaven? Yeah. And he created all things in heaven? Yeah, that's what Colossians 1.16 says, even in their Bible. Here, let me show you Colossians 1.16. Even in their Bible it says, all other things were made by him in heaven. It even says it. So it even says, in heaven. In heaven. All right, well, here you go. Let me show you. If you admit that he made all things in heaven, right, that means he existed before heaven. Well, if he existed before heaven, can you please tell me where he existed? You can't tell me in God. God is not a location. He's not a place. He's a state of being. If he exists in God, that means he exists in God's being. But to exist in God's being means that he's part of God and therefore eternal. Because nothing in God's being is created, is temporal. See the dilemma? Is it making sense to you guys? Is that clear? Light, did you get it too? Now let me show you how their Colossians 1 16 again reads in their Bible. Forget the, the the fact that they added the word other. Because I want you to see that even here it says, by means of him, right? By means of him, all other things were made, right? All other things were created in the heavens and on the earth. In the heavens and on the earth. Well, if he existed in God as his word, then God's word existing in him means that God's word is not part of creation. So you're proving my point again. Right? To be in God means that you're not part of creation because creation is out of God, outside of God. It's not part of God. Creation is not part of God that he summoned out of himself. Creation came into being from nothing prior. It didn't even come out of God. So there's no way around this. I hope you got the point. So you see the verse, how they render it? Because by means of him, all other things were created in the heavens. So that's, I hope that's clear. I hope you see how you can just obliterate this objection from Colossians 1, turn it against him to show that they need to bow down to King Jesus as Jehovah their God, one with the Father and the Spirit, and repent of their heresy. That was Colossians 1.
Are you guys up for Revelation 3.14, or is this too much information? You want me to just call it a night and maybe do something some other time? How many of you guys want me to do with Revelation 3.14? Deal with Revelation 3.14. Once, twos, if you're too tired. Because I know we've been here for about nearly two hours, I believe. Thank the Lord and I came in because we get this recorded. No twos? All right. We're going to do Revelation 3.14, but here's what I'm going to tell you to do. Take a stretch break. Go get your dinner, your snacks, your drinks, bathroom break, whatever. Come back in five minutes, God willing. Yep. If you have questions, I'll, I'll take those two before I start Revelation 3. Unless Rob wants to ask all the questions because he, he needs attention. But here, five-minute stretch break. Stretch out, go to the bathroom, set up your computer, get your snacks, do what you got to do. Because Revelation 3 will be just as intense if the Lord Jesus is pleased to fill me with the Spirit to bless you. Everything good is from our God, and our God is more real than we can imagine. He's alive, folks. Christ is alive. He's real. This one we're reading about, he really made everything. He created us, and he loves us, and he saves us, and we will see him. Truly, we will, because he's alive. May he destroy our fears and doubts. Unbelief can never doubt that and keep us in love with him. We love you, Lord Jesus. Cover us by your blood. Cover my wife and daughters by your blood, Lord Jesus, please. All right, guys. Five minutes stretch break. Even though you got to sleep, God bless you, brother, and fill you with the Spirit. This will be on YouTube either tonight or tomorrow. So even the part you missed will be recorded. So I'll send you the link so in Revelation 3. So don't worry about it, brother. Thank the Lord for Nehemiah. You're going to get a uh, the link to the recording. So Lord be with you, bro. All right. Here's the link to the song. Someone's asking me for the link. <clears throat> now let me give you some articles to go with my discussion. Here, light, and everyone else. Here's the article I wrote on Revelation 3.14. Revelation 3.14. You'll see. If you go here, if you save the link. So there you'll see. I post the link twice. It's answer, Answering Joe's Witnesses, Part 1A. So Answering Joe's Witnesses, Part 1A. The source and rule of God's creation. So obviously there's a Part 2 to this. It's Part 1B. Right? Part 1B. Okay, that's the first link. Let me get uh, answering your witnesses part one. Hold on a second. Answering Jehovah's witnesses. Oops, didn't show up. Answering Jehovah's witnesses part one. What happened, brother? Hold on, guys. Let me get you the link. What? Where the hell? Here we go. Answering Joe's witnesses. Okay. That doesn't show up. All right, hold on, guys. Let me get you part 1B, one too. I want to get that as well. Yep, here it goes. Part 1B. There you go. This is the, the second half of that article. Save the link, guys. This is on Revelation 3.14. Okay, can you save this link? Lord willing, I will. I've done it so many times, I'll do it again. But right now, I want to do Revelation 3.14. I even have it on YouTube. There's a YouTube account, a brother years ago. I think he was from Hawaii. He would record my session. So my talk on Angel of the Lord is there. I'll get you the link later. Do you want it now before you go? Let me get you the link. Or do you know where that link is? Please think. Okay. Did the second link show up? Uh, go, go to? Here, let me post it again. Did that show up? Do you guys see that link? No? Oh, my goodness. Are you kidding me? <sighs> oh, man. All right. Here. Uh, Rob, here, Rob, let me do it. Let me send it to you. See if you can post it in the room. Please, if you got work tomorrow, then, hey, don't torture yourself. It's going to be recorded. Rob, see if, try to post this if you can. See if it goes through. If not, I'll tell you how to find it. Right? Really? No, it didn't show up. I want to show.
Okay, did it show up? Did it show up or no? Did that link show up? All right, here's this last way to do it. Go to bad mana here. Bad mana. Bad mana dot WordPress dot com. Go there. Click on it. Go to the search engine. Put answering Jehovah's Witnesses. Spell it correctly. Answering Jehovah's Witnesses, and it's going to come up. Look for part 1A, part 1B. It'll show up. For some reason, I can't post the link. So sorry about that, guys. But here's the link. You go to batmana.wordpress.com. Did that show up at least? The Lord Jesus and and I will edit this to remove all unnecessary lag. Okay. Go there, light, and everyone else who wants the articles, you put in, in the search engine, answering Jehovah's Witnesses. It'll come up. Part 1A, Part 1B, and then read all of it. I have a series. Part 1A and Part 1B deals with Revelation 3.14. If you're on my Facebook page, Lord willing, tonight I'll post it. But now let's deal with Revelation 3.14, shall we? Revelation 3.14, here's, here's the passage and here's the objection. Okay. I don't know why it didn't show up. Man, this is pal talk. Pray that it gets better. Revelation 3.14. Revelation 3.14. Here it is. Oh, praise the Lord. It came through. Oh, you posted it, huh? Okay, glory to God. All right. Did you see that? All right, post it one more time. Post That's part 1B one more time. And I'm going to get part 1A. Wow, that's good, man. Praise the Lord. It came up. All right, hold on. Let me give you part 1A. Oh, glory to God. How come it went for you but not for me? Hmm, interesting. All right, here. Let me get you part 1A then so you can post it for everyone. Thank you, brother. Thank you, and thank you for your patience dealing with me, brother. The Lord bless you for that, really, and reward you for tolerating me for the sake of the Lord. Here you go. Let me give you now. Okay, let me give you the other link. Okay, Rob, here's the other link. Thank you, brother. Here's part 1A. Guys, save it. So thank our brother Rob. He was able to post it. He's going to post it again. Okay, brother, if you don't have no work, it's up to you, man. I don't want you to torture yourself. It'll be recorded. Oh, the HTTPS doesn't come through? All right. Sorry, brother. Okay, there it goes. Did mine show up now that I re re removed HTTPS? Did mine show up too? Okay, praise Jesus. Okay, Light, you got the links now. Part 1A, Part 1B. Okay, focus on that. Lord willing, this, this goes in depth. What I'm touching here, what I'm going to touch on now, is in that article. So let's begin. Are we ready? Here's their objection. Let me first, again, get you the verse. Revelation 3.14. I'm using the King James. They're going to use their translation. That's fine. The point is basically the same. Here's the point. Okay. Revelation 3.14. As the Lord Jesus grants me unction by His Spirit to glorify Him. Okay, here's Revelation 3.14. Did that show up? Did you see it? And unto the angel the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Did you see that verse, guys, that I posted? Did it show up? Okay. Light, Renee, everyone pay attention to the objection. It's the last sentence. The beginning of the creation of God. Jehovah's Witnesses will tell you that the word RK, RK, right? The word RK in Greek can mean beginning, can mean source, can mean starter, can mean origin, right? Originating cause. It has a variety of meanings. In fact, the word RK has been adopted into the English language. The word arche, like archbishop, archangel, architect, archbishop. The word arch comes from arche. Archangel, the word arc comes from arche. Notice archbishop means chief bishop. Archangel means chief angel because the Greek word arche, arche, arche can mean chief, ruler, beginning, Beginner, right? Starter, source, cause, right? It has a variety of meanings. It's a context will tell you the precise meaning. What they're trying to prove to you here is that the beginning of the creation of God means that when God created, he began with Jesus by creating him first. Jesus is the beginning in that God created Jesus first. So Jesus is the beginning. The first one created in a series of created things. 
You understand what they're what they're trying to tell you? You understand what how they're defining the word RK? Christ is the beginning of creation in the sense that God began with him by creating Jesus first and everything else followed. He's the first in a series of created things. Do you guys understand their objection now? Before I move on. Does everyone understand their objection? If you still don't understand it, put it to, because I can't move on if you don't get it. Because i got to make sure you understand, so by the grace of God I can refute it, and now we have it recorded. It will be on YouTube for future reference. Nobody else, huh? Everyone went to sleep. Only Patar is answering. Hmm, interesting. If you still didn't get it, it's okay. I'll explain it to you. How many people didn't get it, put a two? Okay, Emma, let me help you. Yes, that's their assertion. But why do they assert that? The beginning of the creation. Okay, if I were to say to you, hey, what's the beginning of the creation? You tell me, well, the beginning of the creation is when God created the heavens. That's the beginning. That's when it started. It started when he created the heavens. You get it, M.M.? So, hey, man, what's the beginning of creation? Well, the beginning of creation is when God created the heavens. So the heavens started it. When God created the heavens, that's when it began. It started then. That's what they're telling you beginning means here. Jesus is the beginning of creation in that when God started creation, he began with Jesus by making him the first creature. You get it? You understand their objection, Renee, everyone else, Christian princess? Because, like, I lost every one of you. Pitar? Yeah, that's what they believe before the heavens. Because, like, Jehovah's Witnesses believe Jesus is the first creature. He is first. Heavens came afterwards, and Jesus made heavens. That's the official Jehovah's Witness position. He's the first creature. If heavens were made before Jesus, then he's not the first creature. He's not the first created thing. But you see how they're using this verse to prove it, right, Renee and Light? Revelation 3.14 to them means Jesus is the beginning of the creation because God began with him. By creating Jesus first, that's when God started the creation, by making Jesus first. So as God made Jesus, that's when creation began, at the creation of Jesus. He's the first thing created. Do you understand their objection before I move on? Right? Do you understand it? So I can now move on and refute it. Light and Renee, if you're still confused, that's okay. I don't need to rush. But you got to understand their objection to know how to respond to it. Okay. So please, you got it. Doc, you got it. Pitar, you got it. MM, you got it. Christian Princess, you got it. I don't know. Renee, did you get it? Well, Light, the point is, why is he called the beginning of the creation of God? Why is he called the beginning of the creation of God? Now, if you were, you're a Trinitarian, how do you answer that? Why is he the beginning of the creation of God? God? Christ has no beginning. Would you say God is the beginning of creation? You understand their logic? I want you to see their logic. Which one of you would say God is the beginning of creation? Yeah, but it doesn't say origin. It says beginning, meaning the one who was created first. See, now you're thinking beginning in the terms of God is the source, the origin, the originating cause of creation. You'd be right. But would you say God is the beginning of creation, or would you have said God is the source of creation, the originating cause, the one who started creation by making it? Do you get the point? So you wouldn't necessarily say God is the beginning of creation, right? Because you would, you would assume that miscommunicates, right? Because to say to someone, God has been creation, they say, well, what do you mean he's a beginning creation? God created it. Yeah, I mean, beginning is the source of creation, the originating cause. That's what I mean. So you wouldn't say beginning of creation. You would say something more precise. The source of creation, the cause of creation, the originating cause, the one who made it, and he rules it. Okay, now that you understand, here's my question again, Mike. Do you see how they are defining beginning of creation? Jesus is the beginning of creation in the sense that when God started creation, he began with Christ as the first creature. And that started it. Everything else then followed. Does everyone understand their objection? I, we know it's heresy. But guys, come down. I'm going to refute it by the grace of God, but I first got to make sure everyone's on board to understand the objection. Right? If you don't understand objection, you won't know why I'm refuting it. 
Okay. Do you guys understand it finally or no? Light is, is still catching up, so I want to make sure she got it. So you got it now, Light. Okay, good. If she's got it, that means we're all on board. I don't know what you mean, their genesis starts different. What do you mean? What do you mean their genesis starts different? Be more specific, brother. Don't speak in vague generalities. Genesis 1-1, they'll tell you, is the creation of the physical cosmos. Jesus existed before the physical universe. Yes. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And they'll say the heavens and the earth means the physical universe, not the absolute creation of everything. You get it now? So, in the beginning, God created the physical universe. But he used Jesus to create the physical universe, but Jesus himself was created before the physical universe. That's how they understand it. You get it now? You understand what they believe? They don't believe Genesis 1-1 is not about the creation of everything. The spiritual heavens, the physical heavens, the physical realm. They believe it's not about the creation of the physical universe. Not all the heavens. The spiritual heaven where angels dwell. And the physical heavens. The, the sky above and space. They don't believe that's what it's referring to. They believe Genesis 1-1 is not about God creating the physical universe. But angels and Jesus and spiritual heaven existed before the physical heavens and earth were made. You understand how they interpret Genesis 1-1? You get it now? You guys understand what they believe about Genesis 1-1? Yeah. They believe Jesus existed before the heavens and earth of Genesis 1-1. Why? Because the heavens and earth there is the physical universe. So it's not about the beginning of the creation of the physical universe. Not the absolute creation of all things. That's how they interpret Genesis 1-1. No, John 1, 3, they'll tell you it means the physical universe, because John 1 is referring to Genesis 1, 1. So now you're introducing another objection. If you want me to drop Revelation 3, 14 to deal with John 1, 3, it's up to you, Doc. Why are you introducing another passage, which will then raise another objection from their part, when we haven't even done Revelation 3, 14? God bless you, Rob. So you want me to be here at the 1 in the morning? That's why. I can be here at the 1 in the morning. Doc, because it's a little antsy, can't wait, brought in John 1, 3, where it says the Word made all things. They'll tell you the all things that the Word made is the physical heavens and earth of Genesis 1, 1. Because John is talking about the beginning of the creation of the heavens and earth mentioned in Genesis 1, 1. And that's the physical universe, and Jesus made the entire physical universe. That's how they get around it. But I can't deal with that objection because then I'm going to have to drop Revelation 3.14. So it's up to you. Come on, Doc. It's your world. We're just squirrels in your world because you own it. Okay. Let's focus on Revelation 3.14. Yeah, I know. Let's say it after because, you know what? Please doesn't have, you know, doesn't have to wake up in the morning. You want him to be here until 6 in the morning. I don't have children that I have to attend to because, you know, remember, it's your world, Doc. It's your world, friend. My kids have to bow down to your whims and desires. You own it, friend. Anyway, let's go back to Revelation 3.14. Are we ready? Does everyone understand the objection now? Did everyone understand it? Like, did you get it now, Revelation 3.14? Okay, good. Let's park it in Revelation 3.14. When Doc pays me full-time to do ministry full-time, then I'll stay till 2 in the morning and answer John 1.3. Okay, Doc, that's our deal. Well, you ain't going nowhere, friend. i got to finish this. Thanks to Doc, we wasted 10 minutes. Make sure you edit all this lag. All right, let's finish in Revelation 3.14. Number one, the word RK has a variety of meanings. It can mean the first in a series. Right? The first in a series. So here, Jesus will be the first thing created in the series. It can also mean source. Right? It can also mean cause. Originator, originating cause. Okay, these are all definitions you'll find in the Greek lexicons. It can also mean ruler. It can also mean chief, chief. It can also mean head. 
Now, Joe's witnesses want to insist that beginning means that Jesus is the first thing created, the first in a series. God began creation by starting off with the creation of Jesus. However, the word can also mean Jesus is the source of the creation of God. That when God wanted to create it, he had Jesus create it. The originating, originating cause, the one whom God used to bring creation into being, and its ruler. And that as the one who brought God's creation into being, he's the chief, the ruler of it. Let's see which definition best fits the context of relation. Is it saying Christ is the one that God created first, started creation by making Jesus first? Or is it saying that Jesus Christ is the originating cause, the source that the Father used to bring all creation to being? That the Father assigned to the Son the role of bringing all creation into being, and because he brought all creation into being, he is its ruler, its head, its chief. Let's see which definition best fits the context. Are we ready? Number one, the word arche, arche, the, that word arche is used of God Almighty. Did you know God Almighty is called the beginning in Revelation? Revelation 21, 6 to 7. Let me show you. Revelation 21, 6 to 7, and every Jehovah, Jehovah Witness will tell you this is Jehovah God. Okay? Every Jehovah Witness will tell you this is Jehovah God. What's up, Ed? Maybe you can post verses, bro. Welcome. Revelation 21, 6 to 7. Here. Did it show up, by the way? Did it all show up or no? Revelation 21, 6 and 7. Okay. Praise God he's here. Ed can probably post the rest. Now read with me, Light and everyone else. And he said unto me, It is done. I'm Alpha and Omega. The beginning. Same Greek word in Revelation 3, 14. The beginning. God says, I'm the beginning, RK, and the end, telos. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. And if you ask the Jehovah Witness, who is this? They'll say, oh, that's Jehovah. I will be his God. He will be my son. So Jehovah God says he's the beginning and the end. So then you ask, you ask the Jehovah Witness, I hope this, not, I hope this is not the guy. Anyway, because it's actually late. I'm going to shut down. You ask the Jehovah Witness, what does it mean that Jehovah is the beginning? They'll tell you it doesn't mean he's the, cre the first thing created. He's the beginning in the sense of that he was there at the start of creation because he brought it into beginning. He brought it into existence. Job is the beginning and the end in that he was there from the beginning of creation because he brought it into being. And he will continue to remain with creation till the very end. In other words, guys pay attention, they'll tell you that Jehovah is Alpha and Omega, the first letters of the Greek alphabet. alphabet. In English, you would say, Jehovah is A and Z. Alpha and Omega are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. Alpha and Omega. So Jesus, Jehovah is saying, I am Alpha and Omega. I am A and Z. I am the first, the last, the beginning, the end. Not in the sense that Jehovah was created first. He's the beginning in the sense that he was there at the beginning of creation. Because he made it. And he'll remain with creation till the very end. Why? Because unlike creation... Jehovah is beginningless and timeless. So he could be there from the start of creation, and he can remain with creation till the end of it. Do you understand what it means for him to be Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end? Is it making sense? No Jehovah Witness will say that Jehovah is beginning in the sense of being the one created first. Do you understand that too, Light? beginning in the sense that he's there at the beginning of creation because he brought it into being and therefore he's beginningless. So I could be there at the beginning and I'll be there till the very end because I was there at the start of creation because I made it and because I'm outside of creation, I can remain with creation till the very end. In other words, this title refers to Joah being timeless. Sovereign over time because he's timeless. He was there at the start of creation and he'll remain with creation till the very end because he's not bound to time. Now you ask a Jehovah Witness, can anyone other than Jehovah be Alpha and Omega begin and the end? They'll say, absolutely not. Only Jehovah can be at the beginning of creation because he's timeless. And he can remain with creation to the very end of time, to the end of the age, because he is immortal. His years never end. Therefore, only he can be said to be 
alpha and omega, A and Z, begin and the end. All right, good. So you got them to admit that that word beginning, RK, doesn't necessarily mean the one created first. Because RKs apply to Jehovah. Doesn't necessarily mean the one who was created first in a series of created things. That's what you want them to admit. Because now you're going to take them to Revelation 22, 12 to 13. Do me a favor, Ed Van Halen. If you can, post Revelation 22, verses 12 to 13. I may have to do a part two on this, Lord willing. Because we've got to finish this within 30 minutes, God willing, before Nehemiah leaves. Revelation 22, 12 and 13. Watch here now. Watch what happens here. And if you can't do it, let me know. I'll just post it. Revelation 22, 12 to 13. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. Yeah, it didn't show up, Ed. You're going to either have to break it section by section. Here, let me see if I can do it. Because I don't. I want to do it in the King James. This guy keeps quoting some other version, which I don't know what it is. It's okay, I don't mind, but I want to stick with the King James for now. Okay? Put it right here. Tell me if this shows up, guys. Revelation 22, 12 to 13. Did that show up? Can you see that? Did you see it or no? Okay, good. Glory to God. Light, everyone else, pay attention. Behold, I come quickly. Pay attention to that language. I come quickly. My reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and last. Again, Jehovah Witness will tell you this is Jehovah God. Why? Because only Jehovah can say I am Alpha and Omega, A and Z. Only Jehovah can say I am the beginning and the end. And we now know what that means. Jehovah's the beginning in that he was there at the beginning, the start of creation, because he made creation. And unlike creation, he's timeless. His years never end. So he remains with creation till the end of the age. So I am the start of creation, and I will bring the creation to its goal, to the end of the age. I am at the start of it. I'll be there at the end of it when I usher in the new heavens, new earth. So this basically shows that God is eternal, timeless and sovereign. Okay, now watch though. Get them to admit this is Jehovah God. Now I think that Arian Heretic is here, but I'm going to have to then reschedule our dialogue for tomorrow because it's late here. I hope he's listening so he can prepare his rebuttal by the grace of God. Okay, now pay attention though to the one who's speaking. Behold, I come quickly. Behold, I come quickly. So the one who's speaking is the one who's coming quickly. The one who's coming soon. Now, we're going to see who that is in the context in a minute. But I want you to pay attention. I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. So the one coming quickly will be the one who will pay everyone according to what they've done. And then he says, I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning, the end, the first, and the last. Now, tell me if verse 20 shows up. Revelation 22, verse 20. Did you see that? Revelation 22, verse 20. Okay. Guys, read now. Revelation 22, verse 20. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen? Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Bam! And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and last. Verse 20, the same chapter. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Bam. The one speaking in 12 and 13, the one who said, I'm coming quickly. I am Alpha and Omega. <clears throat> the beginning and the first last is Jesus Christ, according to that same chapter. Jesus now said, I am Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end, first and the last. Jesus said that. But hold on. Only Jehovah is beginning and the end. Only Jehovah is Alpha and Omega. Because only Jehovah is timeless, eternal. Only Jehovah has been there before creation began. And only Jehovah will remain with creation till the end. And yet Jesus says, I who come quickly, I am Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end, first and last. So then how can you say Jesus is the first creation of God, that God started creation by creating Jesus first, 
When Jesus says, I am Alpha and Omega, like Jehovah is, I'm beginning and like Jehovah is, in other words, like Jehovah, he's been there from the start of creation, and he remains with creation till the very end, because unlike creation, he's not bound to time, he transcends time. So how are you going to then use Revelation 3.14 to try to prove the contrary that Jesus is a creature? How dare you misquote Revelation 3.14 when the very context of Revelation goes out of its way to show that Jesus with the Father is the eternal God of all creation. And it reads the same way in their Bible. Well, hold on, maybe you didn't get it. Let me do it again. Let me post it back to back. But now I'm going to do something else. Okay, we're almost done. It's all in my articles, by the way. Okay, now, the Revelation 22, here's 12 to 13. Don't post anything yet, because I want to now post them back to back. If, even in their translation, it reads the same way. Their own translation reads the same way. The New World Translation of Jehovah's Witnesses. Okay? Reads the same way. No. Now, here's Revelation 22, 12, 13, and verse 20. Do you guys all see it? Is it all together? Did it, did it show up? Okay, now, light, and everyone read again. Read. Read it. Read it with me. And behold, I come quickly. I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and last. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Right there I can end the debate. Revelation 3.14 does not mean that Jesus is the beginning of creation in the sense that God created him first. Revelation 3.14 is saying that Jesus is the beginning of creation in the sense that he's the originating cause, the source, the one the Father used to begin creation by creating it. And because he created it, he is its ruler and chief. That's what it means in the context of Revelation. But hold on. It's going to get better. Okay, hold on. We're going to get better, friends. I'm going to break these down for you. Okay? Let me break these down for you. It's going to get even better, friends. Hold on, friends. Let me break these down in sections. Don't comment until I post all of this. Revelation 22, verses 12 to 16. Hold on. Okay? That's Revelation 22, 12 to 13, but I'm going to go all the way to 16. Watch. I'm going to have to take my time and be slow and methodical. Let's see who's speaking. Okay. Here's 22, 14, and 15, and now 16. Nothing in the context shows that speakers have changed, that one speaker speaks in certain verses, and then someone else interjects. Now, did all, all those verses show up? Revelation 22, 12 to 16. Did, do you see them all? I just need one one to confirm. Is it all showing up? Nobody's posting. Okay, good. Okay, now let's read. Read with me. Revelation 22, 12, 16. Let's read it. You tell me who the speaker is. Pay attention, guys. Here, verse 12, all the way to 16. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, and the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without are dogs, and sorcerers, and whoremongers, and murderers, and idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. I, Jesus, bam! I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. Do you see who the speaker in 12 is? The speaker continues speaking to 16, and in 16 he identifies himself. He says, I, Jesus, am coming quickly. I, Jesus, am coming with my reward. I, Jesus, will give to every man according to his work. I, Jesus, am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Do you guys see it? If you read Revelation 22, 12 to 16, it is inarguable Jesus is speaking. I, Jesus, said all these things in verses 12 to 15. And then when you add verse 20, he who testified to these things saith, I come quickly. Amen? Come, Lord Jesus. What else do you want? What else do you want from Revelation 22, 12 to 21 to show that the speaker in 12 is inarguably Jesus, and he says, like God, I am Alpha and Omega. I am A and Z. 
like God, I'm the beginning and the end and the first and last. Well, God is beginning and the end and Alpha and Omega, A and Z, because God is beginningless. He has no beginning, so he's there at the start of creation and will remain with it till the very end. The only way Jesus can claim those very titles for himself, if like God, he's beginningless, timeless, so he's there when creation began, and he remains with creation till the very end, which means that Revelation 3.14 means that Jesus is not the beginning of creation in the sense that God created him first. Jesus is the beginning of God's creation in that God appointed Jesus to be the source, the originating cause, who brought all creation into being, and by virtue of creating all things, bringing creation into being, Jesus is the chief and head of all creation. That's what it means. Does everyone get it now? And the Joe Witness Bible reads the same way. And all this information is in those articles. Let me end it with this one. Now, Lord willing, I'll go more in depth tomorrow, if God wills. Don't forget, tomorrow's my Bible study. 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Hopefully, Nehemiah will be there to record it if he can. God bless him. Here's the final proof that Jesus is no creature. So he's not the beginning of the creation of God because God started creation by creating Jesus first. That's not what it means in the context of Revelation. It means that he is the originating cause, the one whom God used to bring all creation into being because Christ created it all, sustains all, and by virtue of being its creator, he's the chief of creation, the head. So RK means he's the head of creation because he caused creation to come into being. You get it now? What it means? And let's end it with Revelation 5.13. Revelation 5.13. Does it make sense, light, what it means for Christ to be the beginning of God's creation? And did you see how clear the context is that Jesus claims to be Alpha and Omega, beginning and end, first and the last? Meaning he's just as old as the Father, timeless like the Father, and the Holy Spirit with them. All three of them are eternal, timeless, beginningless. Revelation 5.13. Did that show up? Revelation 5.13? Did it come through? Okay, let's end it with this because Nehemiah's got to go. If, you, if, you, if that wasn't clear, Revelation 22, if it wasn't a knockout and a nightmare, this should be clear. And every creature, notice, not some, every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such are as are in the sea, every creature that exists everywhere, and all that are in them. Notice John literally exhausts the language to make sure that you do not miss the point. Every creature that exists everywhere will eventually do the following. So every creature everywhere in heaven, on earth, under the earth, the seas, and all them in them, heard I saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. End of story. If every creature in existence is giving God on the throne, which is the Father here, and the Lamb, the Father, Son, Jesus, blessing and honor and glory and power forever and ever, that means Jesus is being worshipped in the same sense that God the Father is being worshipped and being worshipped by every creature in existence, which means that Christ is not part of creation, but separate from every created thing, and he's on the same side that God the Father is. How in the world, then, are you going to make him a creature when here in verse 13, every creature in existence is on one side, and Jesus is separated from them on the other side, on the side of God the Father? Like, where did you, where did you leave out? What did you miss? I want to make sure Light got this. What did you miss? Which part did you lose me, Light, because you went out? I want to make sure she gets it because I'm going to repeat it for her. All right, so where, what was the last thing you heard? Help me, so I can then show you. What's the last thing you heard? I'm going to end it here. Hold on, let's see what's the last thing she heard. Because I want to make sure she gets it. Oh, you, so you heard me finish from I-13? Okay, one more time. Let's repeat it again. Glory to Jesus. Notice light again. You heard me say this yesterday. This is a, this is a passage you should memorize. If you forget everything else, this is the passage that's a nightmare. And every creature, Revelation 5.13, in heaven, and if you still don't get it, on earth, still not getting it, under the, under the earth, still not getting it, and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them. Literally, John says, every creature that exists everywhere, every created thing you can imagine, 
will eventually do this. They're going to do it. Voluntarily or involuntarily, they have no choice. Every creature in existence, I heard saying, blessing and honor and glory and power. Be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Again, two things. Every creature in existence gives Jesus the exact same worship that God the Father receives, and he receives it forever and ever for the same duration that the Father receives it. That's one. Number two, how can Jesus be a creature when John says every creature everywhere is on one side worshiping Jesus, where Jesus is now differentiated, distinguished, separated from every creature in existence, and placed on the same side that God is on. How can you even dare say that Christ is a creature when every created thing in existence is on one side, worshiping Jesus who's on the other side, on the same side that God the Father is? How dare you misquote Revelation 3.14 to prove that Jesus is a creature? Now, don't get me wrong. Christ did become part of creation. When he chose to enter creation and become born as a man, taking a human nature from the blessed womb of his blessed virgin mother in the power of the Holy Spirit, she conceived him without sexual intercourse, gave birth to him as a virgin. That human nature of his, that physical body, is part of creation. But Christ, the person, is not a creature. He's eternal, who took on a human nature that was created. Where's the Holy Spirit? Are you serious? You're kidding me, right? Do I need to spend an hour to show you where the Holy Spirit is in Revelation? No, you're not. You're pretending to be a beginner, so I don't tear into you to shreds. Why would I need to now talk about the Holy Spirit when the point was to refute that Jesus is a creature? And why would you ask me a question about the Holy Spirit when I just told you I have to go because Nehemiah doesn't have much time. He has to end the session. Why would the Holy Spirit be in that verse? But why would he be in that verse? I think MM is itching for a bounce. What do you guys think? Was I clear, guys? Hold on, hold on. Was I clear that Nehemiah said he's got only 30 minutes? Was I clear that I'm going to end it with Revelation 5.13? Because Nehemiah wants to end the session, so he's got to go. So then why would you ask me where the Holy Spirit is, which means that I need to take another 20 minutes to show you that the Holy Spirit is there with the Father and the Son. In fact, in Revelation 5, 6, the Holy Spirit is actually said to be attached to the face of Christ. Did you know that? In Revelation 5, 6, it says, I saw a lamb as though it had been slain with seven horns and seven eyes which are the seven spirits of God that roam throughout the earth. So the seven spirits is John's way of symbolizing the Holy Spirit in all his perfection, because the number seven in the Bible means completion and perfection, unless the context shows it's actually seven. So the seven spirits means the Holy Spirit in all his perfection. And notice where the Holy Spirit is? He's on the face of the land. So he's not part of creation. He's there on the face of the land, the Lamb's seven eyes is the Holy Spirit that the Lamb uses to see everything in creation. So he's not there as part of creation. He's there with the Lamb and with the Father in Revelation 5, 6. So did you guys see where the Holy Spirit is in Revelation 5, 6? The Holy Spirit is depicted as seven spirits who appears as seven eyes, seven eyes on the face of the Lamb. The Lamb doesn't literally have seven eyes, and he doesn't literally have seven horns. Seven horns, seven eyes are symbolic. Horn represents a king in Revelation. Revelation 17, you can read 12. There you're told the horn is a king who has a kingdom and authority. The number seven in reference to God means perfection. Why? Because after God created all things in heaven and on earth in six days, he saw that it was very good, and on the seventh day he stopped because his work was completed and finished. Genesis 2, verses 1 to 3. So that tells you the number seven 
becomes a number of completion, perfection. It's finished. It's complete. Lacks nothing. So seven eyes means that Jesus sees everything perfectly. Nothing escapes his grasp. And the seven spirits are the seven eyes of Christ, which means that Christ, by the Holy Spirit, sees the entire creation as a present reality because Christ's Spirit fills the earth. And so the Father and the Son are present with us by the Spirit because the Spirit mediates Christ's presence to us, right? Where by the Spirit, the Father and the Son see the entire creation present before them. So the seven eyes are the seven spirits and they're on the face of the lamb they're not part of creation revelation 5 verse 6 is that clear did you get it now so i love you mm but not too much and if you ask me a deep theological question that entails more than two minutes to answer i will hunt you down and your family oh yes i will and when i find you I will stone you. Oh, yes, I will. Anyway, MM, Lord willing, I'll be on tomorrow night, 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Now, guys, thank you for loving me for the sake of the Lord. Thank you for the for dealing with me because you see I got issues. But please pray for me. Pray God will make me a lot more patient, a lot more gentle because I need it. And if I offend you, forgive me for the sake of the Lord. I pray that I bless you more than I offend you for the glory of Jesus, right? So tomorrow, 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I'm going to have my weekly Bible study, Lord willing. I hope Nehemiah is here to record it. And then I'll continue discussing where the Holy Spirit is. So, M.M., if you're on tomorrow, Lord willing, I'll discuss the Holy Spirit and Revelation. Just to help you see that he's not part of creation, he's part of God. Revelation depicts the Spirit as with God and the Son, not part of creation. So there you have three that are not part of creation. God on the throne, the Lamb, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. All right? I hope this blessed you. Light, I hope this blessed you. I hope it showed you more proof that Jesus is God Almighty. He's more real than you can imagine. He's alive, Light. Guys, just remember, you're reading about someone who's alive. He's real. He created you. You will see him face to face. You will see him because he's real. And may the Lord always strengthen us to never doubt that. No matter what we see, what we go through, even if they kill us, not to be afraid because Christ is alive. He's almighty. He's closer to us than we can imagine. And I pray the Lord speaks to you in a miraculous way because he is life itself, the Father's beloved, one with the Father and the Spirit. We love you, Father, Son, and Spirit, in Jesus' name. Guys, let me give you the links. Pray for the support that the Lord puts in your heart to want to support us. Please consider it. Pray for us. Our provision comes from the Lord. Patreon, which is a great way to contribute. Lord willing, the day will come where I make enough that I don't worry and I can devote myself entirely to ministry. It's not about the money. The Lord save us from that. It's about His glory because He's worthy. He's worthy. Praise His name. Here's the link. Pass it on. If you know people contribute, amen. Praise the Lord. That's the best way to contribute unless you want to donate online to the South Asian Friendship Center, which is the ministry I'm part of. Let me give you that link. But more importantly, save those links that I gave you to those articles. Study them. It is a joy for me to be here to serve you. You're a blessing to me, and let me tell you how you're a blessing to me. If it wasn't for you coming to the room, then I would have no reason to teach. So by you coming here, trusting the Lord to use me to teach you, you're blessing me because you're enabling me by the grace of God's Spirit to use my gift to glorify Christ and build you up. So thank you. I want to thank Jesus for you. You wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Jesus. And I want to thank you from my heart. I love you for the sake of the Lord. I don't mean to be tough with you guys. But realize it's in love. I love you guys for the sake of Jesus. And it's because of Jesus. If it wasn't Jesus, you wouldn't be here, I wouldn't be here. So thank Jesus, the Son of God. It's He's the reason why we're here. We love you guys. And Renee, I gave you my email. Let me give it to you.